It's time! Hey, Dave, listen up, please. Sometimes a warrior just has to kind of lay down on the ground for a minute, just stay there for a second and have a good bleed. So what are you waiting for? I don't know, something amazing. Matt, for maybe the win. Gafford, oh. buckle up! Oh! <laughs> Welcome into the basketball podcast of Mid America. Seth Campbell joined alongside six feet apart, Scotty Borderline, and Scotty. I kind of like it. They can't see it, but you're kind of growing out the mustache here for uh, the quarantine challenge. It's coming in very. It's coming in nice, much better than I thought it was going to. This is about. I've got about two weeks of growth on it. So what it's does pretty good? What does the wife think about it though? She, I was shocked last week when I started growing it out. It was about a. It was about a week in, and she actually said that she liked it. There you go. We're oh. about two weeks in now, and she's starting to waver a little bit on that. So we'll have to check back in on the status of the mustache right. by this time next week. Right. I shaved everything else on my face except the mustache, and so it's like really popping right now. I, and I don't know if she's like a big fan of it anymore. I, I don't know. When I saw you when we first pulled up today, I just got vibes of a Blaine Knight kind of look. Yeah, Blaine Knight had kind of a little nasty stash. Uh-huh. I think it's kind of Casey Martinish too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a little, got a little bit of a dirt bag feel to it. There you go. And plus, my hair is as long as it's probably ever been. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I literally don't remember the last time I got my hair cut. Like it was probably, gosh, we're in mid, almost mid April. I bet it's been two and a half months. Mine was so bad that I, I did the, the unforgivable sin almost in quarantine. I let Megan cut it, but she did a really good job. In yeah, I'm not, letting, I'm not letting Mallory cut my hair. No offense, but I'm not. <laughs> that's not happening. I, I was really surprised. She's like, you can cut it. And I, was, and I said, you know what? The worst thing that can happen is I'm not going to see just a ton of people. Scotty will make fun of me, but that's, a, <laughs> that's about it. So if it worst comes to worst, we'll just shave it all off. But so she did a decent job. My dad has so i was texting with my dad last week and like he told me that he has not gone to like a a, he's not gone to see like a barber or he's not gone to a place that cuts hair in probably 25 years nice seriously he he's got this thing called a floby okay which if you don't know what that is google it it's seriously the it's the strangest slash kind of neatest thing that you've seen. Like he just, he cuts his own hair. And so he doesn't have to go, he doesn't have to go anywhere. But that flow beat is, I mean, you look online, like the prices for those things are outrageous. Okay. So it, it's a circular razor. So you kind of hold it in your hand like a a brush almost, a circular brush. And you just kind of go over your head. Yeah. It's almost, kind of, almost like a vacuum this type is- thing. This is interesting. I was, it's really uh, weird. So he's he's offered to to pull that out for me if I'm a, if I'm able to go see him anytime soon. You get you getting desperate over there. Pretty much, like I said, I'm not letting Mallory do it. So my dad is about the only person I trust with my <laughs> hair at the moment. Oh uh, well, we got a, a decently loaded podcast for you today, considering the circumstances of basketball. We've play your small violin we have been without basketball for about a month now yeah just a little over a month and uh it's it's getting sadder and sadder especially as the season goes on i guess we're i'm kind of getting over it now we're not in the middle of the NCAA tournament and been like this was the first round this is supposed to be the sweet 16 this is supposed to be the final i was driving here i was at a red light i was looking at my phone and i see a tweet from john rothstein he said he put out some interesting what he thought was an interesting note about the last two national championship teams, which are Villanova and Virginia. And I'm just like, Virginia just gets to be the national champ for like an extra year, which. You know what? They probably deserve that. It kind of sucks. They probably deserve that though. After being the first team yeah, to lose to a They get to bask in it a little bit, a little bit longer than, than most. Yeah. So they, yeah, they're the only teams that gets to be 
defending national champions for two years in a row without winning the, a title the second year. That's going to be a trivia yeah, question Yeah, I, I thought that was really strange. That, just current state of things. Yeah, just store that away because that is going to be – that is going to be a trivia question somewhere. You're going to have the back-to-back champions like the Florida Gators, and UCLA did it. I'm sure. I don't know how many times, but now Virginia is national champion for two years, and they only won one title. Exactly. How about that? And that is that is a trivia question waiting to happen. All right. On today's podcast, as I said, we got a decently loaded one for you. We're going to talk about Jalen Tate transfer from Northern Kentucky. Also got. Mason Jones comments, and he made those, oh, about a week ago about there's a good chance that he stays in the NBA draft. So we'll discuss that as well as what the roster will look like next year. The Razorbacks did lose a a commitment in the 2021 class. And then we also got a little tease for you on the women's basketball side in Jalen Mason. And I got another story coming about her and somebody else. It's a little tease to stay around. It's going to be pretty entertaining. Yeah, the story on Jalen Mason was good. I'm excited to talk about that a little bit later. All right, let's start, though, at the top. Let's start with Northern Kentucky transfer Jalen Tate. Scotty, you talked to two guys that covered Tate. What did they tell you about him? Yeah, so I reached out to Don Owen, who's a sports reporter for the Northern Kentucky Tribune, and J.L. Curvin, uh, who's a Northern Kentucky basketball beat writer who contributed to the Cincinnati Enquirer. I, I the Inquirer does not have like a Northern Kentucky beat guy on staff, but I guess it's basically, he's basically the equivalent of a, of a stringer. Uh, did good work there. I looked up a bunch of the stuff that he did. Um, first thing that they noted was that he's just like every year that he's been at Northern Kentucky, like he's been a really, really good defender uh, that they both said, that's the number one thing that you need to know about him. You know, when he's been healthy in his college career, he's been, really terrific defensively he had last season he averaged 1.9 steals per game you know he he missed you know that a handful of games because of a, a broken hand he didn't play against arkansas and bud walton arena last season because of that injury that's it i was going to make sure and say that he did not play against the hawks right right but you know just from from everything they've told me you know he's i think he won he was defensive player. He was Horizon League Defensive Player of the Year last year, despite missing some games. And you know he had a personal defensive rating of ninety two point zero, which was uh, the the best figure of his college career to this point. So I think first and foremost, you're just getting a really good defensive player. He's been on the Horizon League All Defensive Team twice in his college career. So you know whenever, like I said, whenever he's healthy, he's a he's a big time plus defensively. It seems like. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people are comparing him to a Jimmy Witt. And I'll ask you, is that comparison fair to Jimmy, fair to Jalen, or is or is it a good comparison? No, I think it's probably fair. Both of those guys are offensive players who are going to get most of their a bulk of their points from like inside the three point line. So I think that much is fair. I think Jalen Tate is a little bit, I mean, obviously he's, a, he's more of a, more of an option from three point range because than, than Jimmy Witt is. Jimmy obviously. was just not an option, but down, down toward the bottom of my story, the first weakness that those guys mentioned is that he really, he struggled from three point range last year. He only made eight threes, I think on 42 attempts, which was, I think that was, uh, shot a career low from three. Uh, he was six of 37 from three in, in conference play, which is not good. But um, J.L. Curvin told me that he there's no doubt in his mind that you know Jalen Tate's going to be thinking about those three point numbers, you know, all off season and and do what he can to to correct it. Yeah, those numbers for him kind of they almost remind me of now I'm drawing a blank on this. They, they almost remind me of numbers that a guy can have but can improve on. We've seen, sure. the, uh, you know, the Desi Sills and um, why is why am I just blanking all of a sudden on uh, Jalen Harris's name? Thank you. Wow. Jalen Harris, um, he didn't shoot the ball extremely well last year, but but this year he was a lot more efficient from he behind. He was better than the year before. Yeah, exactly. You got to give him that. So – 
he worked on it, got in the gym, and I, I think, like you said, that the thing for Tate is that he is going to be in the gym and uh, working on that three point shot. But that's not necessarily what the Hogs will be relying on him for. You talked about defense. That was something that Jimmy Witt brought to this team and that Jalen Tate is going to be expected to bring to this team. But also, he's not a bad inside shot maker, shot taker. Yeah, for sure. And I think another another thing that I think – another aspect of his game that I think is a little bit like Jimmy's is, you know, he's 6'6", six, six, pretty long. And so um, taller than Jimmy, obviously. Um, we'll see – I mean, we'll see if – I mean, just – Filling the void that Jimmy Witt is going to leave is going to be really tough. Yeah, you don't expect that from every single grad transfer you get. For sure. And I think I think he can help recoup some of the things that, that Jimmy Witt and Mason Jones are potentially leaving for Arkansas. You know, one of the things I, I noticed, I was looking at some of the, the analytics on hoop lens. He's, he finishes pretty well at the rim um, for, for a guard and – there's a, a measurement on hoop lens, and we've talked about it before, especially when we were talking – we went over Mason Jones's season review. There's a measurement called points above median, um, which calculates how many additional points a player scores when compared with what an average player would have scored with those same shot attempts. His PAM at the rim in transition um, was 19.7, which is, is pretty good. That, mm-hmm. that was – best on that was best on the team at northern kentucky um and then he's also been pretty good at the rim in non-transition and non-offensive rebound opportunities so just like in the half court at the rim he's really good um in 2019 or last season he had a pam in non-offensive rebound opportunities in non-transition of 22.3 which is pretty good um he was i mean he led northern kentucky in those at the rim in transition and non-transition, non-offensive rebound opportunities. He was tops on the team there. So you feel like you're, like I said, recouping a little bit of what Mason Jones is, is potentially um, is what you're what you're going to be missing if Mason Jones actually does remain in the draft. So pretty interesting there. And one of the um, one of the guys is Don Owen. <clears throat> Don Owen told me that Jalen Tate is pretty clutch performer too and that kind of piqued my interest so i I followed up on that followed up on that response with him and you know jalen tate was had an mvp performance at the horizon league tournament this year he averaged 18 and a half points on almost 60 percent shooting five rebounds three and a half assists one and a half steals over a couple of games so i mean they at least don owen thinks that uh, or he says that jalen's very good in late game situations, which is also something that Mason Jones was fairly good at. Yes. Mason Jones more than likely was going to have the ball in his hands in late game situations for the Razorbacks. We could see maybe something for that for Jalen Tate. Uh, something else that you brought up on the weakness side of the, of things, Scotty, we talked about the three pointer a little bit and how he's struggled with that. I, I'd really like to ask Tate his thoughts on how much that broken hand really affected his shooting for this year. Yeah, both of the guys that I talked to, they they definitely thought that that definitely that played a role in you know a career low season from from three point range for sure. So if you give him an entire off season, if he stays healthy and can work on the three pointer, that I, I just don't see that those numbers will go down anymore. Right now, he may not, not. He might not get to shoot as much either with right. a team with uh, more talented guys around him. I think you said that in your article that yeah, you it, got some snipers coming in from it, from three point range. You got some coming in, and if you have one so called Isaiah Joe, if he comes back, then the pressure for you is not necessarily to really to shoot the three. You can shoot it when you're open, but besides that, really to drive to the hole and create shots that way. Yeah, you really just want him to play his game. Like you just want him to come in and you know see if the you know obviously the the step up in competition might be a little bit of a challenge coming from the horizon league to the sec like it's just a it's a completely different ball game but northern kentucky is a program these guys told me that northern kentucky is a program that just everybody comes in and they just play their role and really selfless really selfless players and so i think that's another attribute that that jalen's going to bring and he, you know if he does just play his game i think that i mean he 
really good at getting to the rim, really good at getting to the line. I think he can improve at the free throw line. I think he was like 67, 69% from the line last season. And so that could obviously stand some improvement as well as his three point shot. But, um, you know, if he can just be efficient inside the arc, I mean, that's a, I think that's a big plus because you're, you've got guys like a Moses Moody and potentially Isaiah Joe and some of these other guys that are, you know, more perimeter oriented players that can be a big plus to your team. You don't, you don't absolutely need everybody to be shooting threes. Yeah. Um, like Jimmy Witt last season understood that the three point shot was more for Mason Jones and Isaiah Joe. I think Jalen Tate, you know, if he, you know, if he can kill it inside the inside the arc, then he's going to leave it to the other guys to do some damage from the perimeter. Yeah, Steph Curry may have revolutionized the game with the three pointer, but not everybody has to be taking them. Exactly. And you're going to have Connor Vanover step out there and take a lot next year as well. So, you know, if he doesn't need to force it up, then he probably doesn't need to force it up. Vance Jackson too, man. He's a mm-hmm. they say he's a shooting guard trapped in a forward's body. Mister Vegas. Yeah, Vegas Vance. Vegas Vance for sure. Two things before we move on. I'm going to talk about a few more weaknesses. But before we hit that, the Northern Kentucky game, you're just talking about the, the vigilance and the squad that Northern Kentucky puts together. Was that the game that Mason Jones didn't play in? Yeah, that was the game after Arkansas went to Georgia Tech and won. And that was the game that, that Mason sat with the supposed shoulder injury. His uh, quote-unquote shoulder injury. You're right. That he came out the next game with tape on his shoulder and quickly, quickly took, took it, it off. off. Yep. I, just an observation just just an observation but that game was close for a lot of it and arkansas didn't have mason jones a but b northern kentucky put up a good fight and northern kentucky had a chance to win that thing yeah in like the in the final minute missed a wide open three in the left corner yes that's the game okay yep yeah because adriel bailey i think overhelped on dribble penetration and left a three-point shooter wide open in the left corner these are the things that you forget about when you have a 30 game season and but yeah, no, that was a that was a chance for Northern Kentucky, and they just didn't hit the shot. You can't really ask for a better late game situation shot. The other thing that I want to talk about with Tate is there's two more weaknesses. Uh, just to mention, he does foul, as you said, he gets into foul trouble, and he can get into high turnover games. Yeah, I I asked both of the guys for weaknesses with uh, with Jalen's game. And one thing they said, just because he is such an aggressive defensive player, he can be prone to like some high foul games. And like we firsthand know that Arkansas committing so many fouls last season at certain points, that, mu- that drove Muss absolutely up the wall. And I think, I think J- Jalen Tate coming in and learning this defense that that Muss is going to be implementing I think that I think that'll probably help him like I don't expect him to be a four fouls per game or four fouls per 40 minutes type of player you know like he was at at Northern Kentucky Um, and I think part of that is just the group of guys that he's got around him like they're like no offense to Northern Kentucky but these guys are probably more the guys he's gonna be playing with next season potentially right are a little bit more talented than the Northern Kentucky so um, but he's been his his fouls per forty minutes number has dropped each of the last three seasons, which is a positive. Yeah, last season it was four point zero for the year, and in conference play, he did foul four four more times in nine of the nineteen games that he played after he came back from injury. So I don't really I don't really know what to make of it. Um, We'll see. Maybe maybe his aggressiveness does get him into into some trouble sometimes. And like who like it happens to almost every player. Like it happened to Mason Jones quite a bit. Right. Too at, at certain points. So I'm interested to see M- Musselman was talking about as soon as the season ended, they're going into maybe some different coverages depending on the personnel that they have in the game. If they switch less, in theory, that would mean that you would get into less situations where you're mismatched, where you know you're switching onto a guard and you would have to foul as much. But at the same time, guys are going to be coming off of screens, and you're maybe having to fight through screens. I'm interested to see if, with a different philosophy, if you have the personnel out on the court with two seven footers, one seven footer, whoever Arkansas has out there, or Vance Jackson, and that you might 
see him foul more or less. I, I'm, I'm not an analytics guy, and I can't tell you right off the bat how that will play out, but that is something to watch out for next season is how all of this with Musselman's new defense and the personnel he's going to put on the floor, if Arkansas is going to foul more or less. Yeah, and like on the on the other side of the coin too, like one of the things I wrote for a strength of his is that he's a high fouls drawn guy. And so that's something that Mason Jones was obviously really good at. He was number one in the country, according to Ken Palm, and fouls drawn per 40 minutes. It was like eight a game. Crazy. Jalen Tate's not quite there, but he's at – 4.8, 5.2, that's still pretty good. That's enough fouls to foul somebody out. For sure. And tells you he's aggressive, and it goes back to him you know, attacking the rim, attacking the paint uh, pretty aggressively. And you know, if he, can, if he can improve his free throw numbers, you know, he might have, a, might have a pretty good season in terms of points per game. Um, one of, another thing that these guys told me, is that another strength that they would attribute to him is his mind. And Jalen comes from a, a really good background. I think I want to say his brother played at Ohio State. Um, I know he's had some family members play play some pretty high-level college basketball, and he um, went to a good high school, enjoys playing the game the right way, according to um, according to Jail Curvin. You know, he won't shoot you out of a game. He just really likes getting to the rim and, you know, getting them. They said getting getting a bulk of his points from the foul line. So I think just improving improving perimeter shooting for when it's needed and also improving at the line I think is going to be a big thing for him. There is the in-depth look at Jalen Tate. I'm excited about him. I, I'm excited about this basketball team. I'm ready for November, October when we can start looking at the team and then November Hopefully. when they start playing. Hopefully. That's one, one thing that one of the – I think it was Don Owen. He sent me an email. He was just like – I just hope Jalen gets to play this fall because, I mean, there's just so much uncertainty, obviously. That would um, just be so A lot sad. of people like to say the only thing that's certain is the uncertainty, but he really hopes to he really hopes to see Jalen play and, you know, flourish at his, at his next stop. Well, a guy that Jalen is probably going to need to take a lot of minutes for is Mason Jones, who said this week, since the last time we released the basketball podcast of Mid-America, that there is a, quote, good chance – that he stays in the NBA draft. Scotty, are you surprised that Mason Jones says that there's a good chance he stays in the NBA draft? I don't think so. I don't think so. Like I wrote this story and there was a guy uh, named Rod Bridgers who I think is, is pretty tight with Jalen Harris. He was like, I could have told you guys that after he dropped 40 on Tulsa back in December. <laughs> like he's, I think he's, he's just got his mindset on bigger challenges. And I think he wants to, he wants to play pro ball somewhere. Like it might not be the NBA right now, but there's like we've talked about it countless times. Like what Mason did this season opened so many doors for him that weren't even there for him. You know when he got here, and he wants to. I mean, he wants to explore, see if he can go play for a check somewhere. And it's like you said, we've talked about this a lot, so I don't want to just run this into the ground. And but at the same time. It was wishful thinking, I think, now, the more you look back on it, that you would get him back here at Arkansas for another year. He had the best year that he's ever had. What more can he do with the talent that's around him? Um, he's going to have more talent around him, more than likely, so he probably means less opportunities to put shots up, less opportunities to score more points, and less opportunities to show his improved abilities if they are improved. So I, I think it's a smart move for Mason Jones to go to the draft. Like you said, whether or not he's drafted, if he goes to the G League, if he goes to play overseas, whatever, that guy deserves to have get paid to play the game, and he will get paid to play the game somewhere. And just the best of luck to Mason in in all of his endeavors. And he was he was an entertaining character to watch this year, to say the least. Yeah, at the very least, you know, if we if we get a chance to talk to him again, you know, this is really off topic, but I wrote that story about. I know I talked to his prep school coach and his junior college coach and his prep school coach, Adam Donny has told me that, you know, when Mason first got to link your prep, that he was, you know, obviously he was the chubby overweight kid, um, kind of, kind of playful, not really serious all the time, maybe serious as he should have been. And he was getting around that campus on a hoverboard. I want to ask him about the hoverboard. Like, why do you, why did you feel like you needed the hoverboard? Cause probably there was a lot of walking involved and he didn't want to walk. No, but I understand. <laughs> yeah, one of the things, like, Mason was asked, and 
I want to point out that he he was he went on the radio with the Morning Rush with Tommy Kraft and Ty Richardson, right? And they asked, I think Ty asked him, you know, have you thought about you know coming back and being you know like the man on campus? And Mason was like, no, you know, like I haven't really thought about that. Like it would he obviously it would be awesome for him if he if he came back. You know, all the attention would be pointed on him, but. I think he's I think Mason's at the point where he doesn't feel like he's got a whole lot more to prove and I think he's also thinking like if I come back I'm probably not going to have the same type of season that I just had um you know he wanted his legacy I think to be that he gave Arkansas everything that he had when he was on the floor and I think he's he's ready to show what his worth is you know wherever that wherever that next step may be so more more power to Mason. You know, it would be awesome if if he did come back because that would be that would be so fun. Like right. the the team next year's team would be so stacked. Um, but you know, it's he says it's time for time to you know test out some some bigger opportunities and more power to him. I'm excited to to watch his journey play out. Yeah, and let's move on now. Talking about the roster for the Razorbacks and what that means. We'll say that Mason is gone. There's a big decision, and he said this on the morning rush. He said, quote, a big decision is coming for my guy, Isaiah. So I just want to let him just make his decision freely. I want to make, I want him to make the best decision for him. So that's a big decision for the Razorbacks. It's a big decision for Isaiah because that's a roster spot. And then Musselman is still going after guys in the grad transfer market or the just the transfer market, the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. And... It's most of them still going after those guys. So the roster is not set by any means whatsoever. But if you look at it with the two transfers that have been added, it's it's not a bad roster right now with the guys coming in. What do you make it's of a it? Pretty int- it's a pretty intriguing group for sure. Like your guards right now, like as of right now, as of this recording, are Isaiah Joe, Desi Sills, J.D. Note, Devontae Davis, KK Robinson, Moses Moody, and Jalen Tate. That's a really good that's a really good cast of guards right there. Right. Really good. And then your forwards, you got Vance Jackson, Connor Vanover, Jalen Williams, Ethan Henderson, Reggie Chaney, and Bebe. It's not bad either. Right. This is it's a really interesting group. And, you know, if this is the group that Arkansas goes into next season with, I think they can feel pretty confident. And I'm I love that. I love those guards. Like the, all of those guards bring something unique to the table, I think. And Isaiah, you know, if, if Isaiah does come back, and I think he's got a couple of weeks until he has to de- uh, until he has to declare. I think it's April 26th is when underclassmen have to declare. So we should know something from Isaiah, you know, within the next couple of weeks, um, which will, you know, determine quite a bit, I think. Uh, in terms of the way the roster looks and whether Arkansas has to go after, you know, maybe another guard or maybe potentially another forward. You know, Arkansas, I think, is in the top 10 for Matt Harms, who's a gigantic human, um, yeah, played, it, it, played at Purdue. When I said that you might have two seven-footers early in the podcast, I guess that's what I was referring to, but that does not mean that he is coming. I just want <laughs> right. to put that out there. Matt Harms is really interesting, and I don't know that I've got my hopes up that, that right. he comes to Arkansas, but if he does come to Arkansas, like that would be enormous. You got, a, I think you got like maybe a day one rim protector. I looked at his Ken Palm page. He's had the top block rate in the Big Ten each of the last two seasons. The Big Ten is not a bad league not to at be all. number one. And block rate in that league is a hell of an accomplishment. Like that's Arkansas almost got to crazy. play them because he was there the last time that the Razorbacks made it to the NCAA tournament. I was wa- it not? watched him firsthand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had Purdue at that time had Carson Edwards, who's one of the funnest guards I've I've watched in college basketball in a long time. They had Carson Edwards, and then they had Matt Harms and Isaac Haas. Isaac Haas and Matt Harms were both, I think they were like 7'3 and 7'1. Yes. I mean, just, they were so big, it didn't make any sense. And it was really funny just thinking about Carson Edwards being like a 5'8 or a 5'9 guard, and then you're running the two other best guys on the, on your team at that point were like seven footers. Yeah. Like it was, it was really interesting to watch. But I'm not saying that Matt Harms is going to come here, but I can't 
I can't lie and say that I haven't thought about what that would what that would look like. Potentially running two seven footers out on the floor would yeah. be insane. And you can't lie and think that Musselman hasn't thought what that would look like as well. Either. Who wouldn't want that rim protection? No, exactly. You're going to force everybody to take the outside shot, and you're going to force everybody to try and guard those guys as well when they get down low. And can you imagine a seven footer Connor Vanover, who we've mentioned multiple times, has range going out on the three point line and you're going to, you're going to try and if, if you have both of those guys in the game, you're going to put your biggest guy on Matt Harms, who's underneath the basket more than likely. Then you're going to try to put your second tallest guy on Connor. If he's not seven foot, Connor could just shoot over him right from the three point line. Connor and, could shoot any, over anybody anyway. Exactly. And we've seen the one game action that we saw Connor in this year was the red white game. And then we also saw him a little bit in practice. The offense can run through Connor Vanover. It can't. And it like that would be insane if you're trying to defend two seven footers at the same time and one of them with range that can knock down three point shots consistently. I'm curious, just I sent you a list of like the guards as of now, the guards group and the forwards group. Give me a guy from each group that you're most intrigued by. Right J- as of right now. JD Note, for sure, without a doubt. In the I'm guards. actually I'm actually hoping to talk to JD Note later in the week. I okay. want to get to to know him a little bit better, but JD's Definitely, he's high on my list too. That's that's a big question mark almost in a way because we really haven't gotten to see him play a lot. We've heard some things from guys about how he was able to run the scout team pretty well, what he did at his past institution, but what is he doing right now? What is he improving on? What is he going to look like in the offense? That's that's who I'm intrigued by, J.D. Note from the guards. Uh, you could also say, you know, I want to see a Moses Moody, how he – Reacts I love Moses. coming yeah. into the league. Uh, that's an interesting spot for well for me as well. Uh, as far as from the big men, I will say, again, Jalen Williams is another freshman that's coming in. I'd like to see how he does. I want to see where Vance Jackson and Ethan Henderson find themselves Yeah. once the season rolls around. Where does Vance – is he more accepting of maybe he is a four – in this offense and he's going to stay down there and just not stretch the offense, the defense as much, or is he going to be the guy that is standing out there still thinking that he's a guard in a forwards body or does Musselman want him to be a guard in a forwards body? Right. Where does he probably wants him to play to his strengths? That would be my, be my guess. And you know, when I reached out to, to a couple of guys who covered Vance, you know, at New Mexico, they told me that, you know, he's not a guy that's going to go on and he's not going to go on the inside and like bang with guys. Like he's going to float. And I think, you know, that goes back to a little bit of the versatility that he's got. Like he can do both. He just prefers more to play on the on the perimeter. And, you know, he's a he's a plus on the glass. So I mean, see, I figure you'll see him play a little bit of both. Yeah, see where he fits in. And then the other guy, Ethan Henderson, if he can keep his growth up, there's a lot of talk right now. Everybody should be really familiar with exponential growth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. with the virus talk and everything going around. Well, It seemed like Ethan Henderson's game in the last 10 to 15 games grew exponentially. Every single time he stepped on the court, he was doing everything that he did before well and doing something else, one other thing better. And if he can continue to improve, I would think that he would be an option off of the bench as well. I'm just curious to see if maybe he did hit a ceiling or if he can keep going. Right. And where he fits in. Yeah, Uh, Those are the guys that He was playing so well toward the end of the season. And it it was really exciting. I think to to watch him, you know, finally get his chance, and you know, he was he had was putting up career numbers in March before the season got called off. Um, for me, like in terms of the guards, I'm going to go with Desi Sills. I'm just, of, I'm, just, of I'm, just, course. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> JD Note is a guy that I've been pretty high on, and vast we've asked about I've asked about JD periodically, and I think he was a guy like you said he was running the scout team, like he was the the lead guard on the scout team and was portraying opposing teams best player most most of the time um unless it was like Saeed Pridget I mean I think Reggie Chaney took that took that role but um, <laughs> see JD Note banging down low mm-hmm. but JD's really intriguing to me and I remember the last time we got Muss on a on a teleconference asked about JD and just the the kind of development year that he was having and he said he's you know he's improving his three point shot a little bit I think he was somewhere around 30% when he was at Jacksonville his last season. And I think his confidence is just growing. And we almost forget 
we almost forget just considering the excitement around all the other guys that are coming in that, you know, JD's done this before. I mean, obviously on a lower level. And so I'm curious to see how that step up in competition, how he's going to, how he's going to handle that. And I think the development year, the fact that he had a year to kind of settle in and go against SEC caliber guys day in and day out, I think that's going to help him a lot. I love Moses Moody too. Love him. And I remember, I think it was in spring of, gosh, it may have been 2018. I went, I helped, I was helping Richard Davenport out. I went to AAO in Springdale and watched Moses Moody play for Brad Beal Elite. And he just, the game, the one game that I watched, I was, I was like in awe. Like it's just, it's one of those guys that you just, you can't take your eyes off of. Is you just, you love the way that he moves, the way that he, you know, the way that he, I just, I loved, loved everything about him. Like he, he shot lights out that day. I think he hit three or four threes, rebounded the ball well, had four or five assists. And one thing I'm really intrigued by, I like his length. I saw him twice block perimeter, like perimeter shots. Like he was maybe a little bit late on a rotation, but his quickness and his length allowed him to, to get on the perimeter and, and block a couple of three point shots, which is, this is crazy. Um, as far as like the the forwards, I love Vance Jackson. I'm like I'm just gonna go ahead and jump on the bandwagon now, the Vegas Vance bandwagon. And I'm with you. I like Jalen Williams a lot. Fort Smith Northside has put out some studs um, in in all like not just basketball but football too. Like Trey Norwood's playing it, um, playing football at Oklahoma now and getting playing time. I know he got hurt last year, but that the place is just like a, an athlete factory. And Jalen. Jalen's got some versatility too, and I think there was a there was a thread on our board about who is going to be Arkansas's Mister Main next year. I think Jalen's Jalen Williams is a pretty good candidate for that. I like I like his game a lot. That's what the roster could look like next year for the 2020-2021 season. There are obviously still some question marks, as we mentioned. Isaiah Joe, if he comes back or if he declares. Mason Jones, I mean, still technically has the option to come back. He has not hired an agent yet, but more than likely Mason Jones is gone. Eric Musselman is still in the transfer market. That doesn't mean necessarily that he's going to get a guy that's ready to play next year. He could also go and do something like he did this year, which he picked up J.D. Note and Connor Vanover and had them sitting on the bench because they had to wait a year. All of that just depends, and it depends – what the scholarship looks like with Isaiah Joe and Mason Jones and how many guys they need to go get. And so, but that is the rough estimate of what the roster will look like next year. Two years from now, just want to throw this out there and make sure that everybody is aware. The only commit that the Razorbacks had in the 2021 class was Duncan Powell. He's from Texas and he ended up decommitting. Wouldn't necessarily say that that is, the sky is falling news. Like don't don't right. panic because right. it's not for the upcoming class. It's for in two years. And he did say Arkansas is still at the top of his list. Now you have to wonder that what was happening that he would decommit or whatever. But with Arkansas still being in the mix, and I have seen this is kind of strange to me, but grad transfer guys that are eligible to grad transfer. There was a a recent guy from Bowling Green. I can't remember necessarily his name. But he's like, I'm going in the tra- I'm going to the transfer portal. Goes in the transfer portal, visits, visits, quote unquote, visits because he can't visit anymore. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, all right, I'm going to go back to Bowling Green. Oh yeah, Justin Turner. Yes, okay, yeah, Justin Turner, because yep. he was one of the higher names in the transfer portal. Yeah, I think he had Arkansas in his top six, and then when he cut it down to three or four, Arkansas missed the cut. But yeah, he was a he was a hooper for sure. And so but he's going, going back, back to going back to where he started. I think there's just the kid committed early. He's the only commit in the class, so. I wouldn't necessarily say this is sky is falling news. We just wanted to make sure that is news that is happening in the basketball world. And we wanted to make sure that y'all were aware of it. Yeah. He's a four-star guy from DeSoto where Mason Jones Mm -hmm. started at a six, seven kid. I mean, I I know one of my buddies, Nick, Nick Mason was, was really high on, on Duncan. So, I mean, it, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that he does still come to Arkansas like he he wrote in his decommitment note that Arkansas will still be heavily considered and he just wants to make sure that he's making the right decision for his college career so I mean 
there's a lot of time between now and when he has to put pen to paper. So, I mean, a lot of things could change and he still could wind up here. Yeah, we saw that what the Musselman staff can do over one summer whenever they were hired last year, what they were, the work they were able to do. And it's going to be a little bit different this year with the virus going around and what that will and won't affect. But at the same time, you still have to believe in the staff and what they're doing. And the class and the team right now, the roster they put together, looks pretty great for the 2020-2021 season. Yeah, they're going to get to work for sure. I'm not I'm not really not really sweating it. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's wrap it up here on the Basketball Podcast of Mid-America. Talking about a fun story that I wrote about women's basketball star Jalen Mason. Mason was a key cog in the Razorbacks team last year, but she did not get to play this year. She was able to – she started every single game, her freshman and sophomore year, and then – I think I went through and looked at game started versus game played in her ju- in her junior year. And it was only like two or three that she didn't start her junior year as well. So she was a key cog in this Razorback women's team. And then I remember going to media day for the Arkansas women's basketball team. We sit there and there's four girls that they sit up at the front. It's Amber Ramirez, Alexis Tolfrey, Chelsea Dungy, and Jalen William, Jalen Mason. And Mason has this big, huge cast running up and down her leg, and you're going, "Uh uh-oh. But she told us then that she just hurt her foot. She wasn't really for sure what it was. We asked neighbors. He said, you know, we're just taking it day by day kind of thing. It wasn't until the middle of the season that he announced that they were going to redshirt her. She had surgery on it. It was really cool to go in and talk to her just about her story, what she used this year for, and kind of what's going through the mind of an athlete. For sure. What was um, what was her like her mindset throughout the the entire season? Like, do you do you feel like she knew like how serious the the injury was like when it happened? So she was on the free throw line. She said, and she shot it and was jumped for the rebound. And it was weird because she didn't turn her ankle or anything. It just happened. She said, just felt a pain. So it's I like a non contact injury. Yeah. Yeah. Those are those can be scary. And so she's like, I got to come out. So she comes out. But she told me, she goes, well, I sat out there for a while, kind of worked it around. I said, all right, well, I went back into practice and I was working practice that day, but I still told the trainer that it wasn't feeling well. They tried four different tape, taping methods to see if they could get it to work. And finally they went to the doctor and that's when the doctor told her that it was a part of her ankle that I'm not for sure what the technical term is, but she had two options. She could either have surgery or she could get a PRP shot, which... I didn't know what a PRP shot was, so I had to Google that. Yeah, it was that. news to me. And and I didn't know they can do this, but you know we're living in the future now. They can take your blood. They take your blood, put it in a machine, and separate the plasma from your blood, and then inject the plasma back into your injured spot, muscle, whatever, mm-hmm. and it heals it faster. And it kind of hardens as well. But she was worried because the doctor said, you have to make sure that when it, that sits right, that everything is going to be okay. I mean, there is a high risk for you re-injuring it as well. So she ended up just having the surgery. How, how do you feel like she handled not playing this year? It was tough. She said so herself that it was tough because she had played. You know, like I said, started every game for two years and basically started almost every game her junior year. So she was a key point to this Razorback team she was the Razorback team. The Razorbacks were ranked in the top 25 coming into the year, and they basically stayed ranked all throughout the year. I think every week except for one week, they were ranked in the top 25. And she was going to be a, another part of this team handling the point guard responsibilities, and she just didn't get to this year. So she was kind of said it was a, a, definitely some adversity that she had to go through sitting on the bench for that long, was definitely unique, but she learned a lot from it, is what she said. You know, when she got cleared to – this says that she got cleared to practice and she took on many different identities. Like she was – I guess once she got cleared, she was practicing as the other team's best player. Yeah, so she pulled the J.D. Note of the men's basketball team. Nice. Uh, she was practicing as the other team's best player. And she said in her story, sometimes I get the better of my teammates. Sometimes my teammates would get the better of me. Um, and Mike said in one of his pressers, he said, man, she whooped our tail today or the other day, and he said she put up 30 points against us. Wow. 
and he said trying to acting as the other team's best player and he said so then you kind of wonder what that would look like if it was playing 38 minutes a night for us but then you just go all right no she's coming back next year she's coming back next year yeah i guess she was like someone toward the end of the year when or i guess right at the end of the year when the season got called off was she like someone that her teammates could like turn to once the once the season ended i guess it's kind of abruptly yeah she was even throughout the entire season, she was a person that her teammates would turn to because she was a part of the team. They could talk to her a little bit more, and she had been through everything. For playing for three years, she knew what the SEC tournament was like. She knew what playing against the SEC competition was like, what these things they're doing. and So she was able to give advice, I would say, to her teammates and that was unique. Also, what was unique and what I'm going to write about a little bit later, so this is a tease to make sure that you get in and read the next story, but she was injured with another player on the team, Macy Weaver. Mm -hmm. And she talked about that her and Macy were pretty good friends before they were injured. And then now the fact that they were spending a lot of time during practice and stuff together, that they became just really, really close friends. And she said, and it was hilarious because... Macy said this actually when I talked to her, but she said, we would drive around Jalen and I, Jalen would have a huge cast on her left leg, I think is what she said, because she could drive with her right leg. So she would drive and then Macy tore her ACL. And before she could get over the tear in her ACL, she broke her foot or her ankle oh on the other leg. And so she's trying to get out of the car, out of the passenger side. And she's got two casts running up and down Brother, like her the legs. Walking wounded. Yeah, Jalen is coming out of the car with a cast. She goes, there had to be people taking pictures and just like making sure they were staying away from us because we had to look like a motley crew for sure. Yeah, no doubt. So what what's she doing now? Is she still getting work in? She is. She's practicing at a YMCA. And the part of the story that I'll get to tell is that she is actually quarantined, quote unquote quarantined, social distancing, whatever we're going to call it, with Macy Weaver. Okay. They are... In Tennessee, where Jalen lives, and they're they're working out at the local YMCA. They have an outdoor court. Going down to the Y. And they are playing at the outdoor court at the Y. Very cool. It it's really interesting and it's really interesting to see how practice and pre- preparation must go on for these people because if you're not preparing and practicing and working out, then somebody else is that's in the league and they're gonna get better. So you have to go from having all of that right there easily accessible. You have the practice facility easily accessible. You have the weights, you have the food to now you're having to go practice at the Y that, you know, the rim may not even be straight. The court, the <laughs> court, that's right. the court is concrete and you're hit it off the backboard and the backboard might fall down. All, that, that, kind of all stuff. that stuff builds character. Exactly. So it, it's really interesting to see how they've adjusted and you know, the show must go on kind of thing. Very cool. Well, I have um, I guess I tried to shake it up, shake things up a little bit at my place last night. And I talked my wife into doing an Instagram live with me. And it turned out to be pretty fun. I think me and Seth should probably do that at some point. Well, what what did you uh, talk about? Just any, like we just had most of the time it was just friends that jumped on. They were just asking questions. You know, Mallory has like a like a, a crush on Heston Kerstad. And so there were like tons of, would you leave Scotty for Heston Kerstad type questions? And she said, yes. Well, she, she said yes in a roundabout way. <laughs> that was, it was pretty fun, but I, I kind of want to start doing those Instagram lives more. That was kind of fun. I think we could do that. We need to set a time. I mean, um, we could do that with this. Yeah, for it sure. It might be a little bit complicated, but we might be able to get it done. We'll, we'll set up a time. We'll set up a more information on it, but for sure, if you'd be interested in Instagram Live going back, you can ask questions that way. You can get your questions in and we can answer them about anything basketball related, not just men's, women's, whatever. We're constantly trying to give you information and to the best of our ability. So be on the lookout, Connor. Connor. Scotty has a upcoming story about J.D. Note. I don't know where Connor came from. Yeah, hopefully I'm getting to talk to him this week. I've been wanting to you know, ask him you know, just get to know him more. Like, is all we know about him right now is he played at Jacksonville and he was the lead guard on the scout team. Like, that's kind of all we know about him. Don't really know much about his background. Um, 
I mean, I've got a bunch of questions typed up. I'm just hoping to get a call from him soon. So we're trying to work on that. As I said, there's a story coming out about the walking wounded of Macy Weaver and Jalen Mason. There's going to be. There's your headline right there. You're welcome. That I love it, but how they're also continuing to work out during the quarantine period, and also there's some other stuff in the works. We're getting together some bigger projects trying to get those out there so just stay tuned on wholehogsports.com yeah do you want to taste the sure. project you're working on sure i'm working on a, it's going to be really really fun when a, it comes out a video project called upon further review i might release a short tease video for it it's not even really tell you much but it's going to get you excited that's the whole point of uh just going back and looking at past razorback events that have happened uh, some people have clamored about what what would you write a 30 for 30 on in Arkansas sports? And this isn't that. I can't go in that in depth. This is not going to be a 30-minute video put together. This is not going to be a mini documentary. But this is going to be a unique look at what is happening in Razor, what has happened in Razorback sports, big moments in Razorback sports, and just kind of rewind back to those. So it's called Upon Further Review. Working on it right now. We hope to get those shows in those uh series it's probably going to be an episode or not an episode it's probably gonna be about four episodes so we're trying to get those out to you asap but looking forward to sharing those with y'all as well i also had an idea there was a i think it was a cleveland based outlet that had a really cool idea for a podcast series where you know they went back and reviewed each game all seven games of the 2016 NBA finals and they had different guests on to like break down Mm -hmm. each game and talk about, you know, the storylines at that point in the series. And I was thinking like, what podcast series could we dedicate to something like what, what has happened in the past that we could dedicate a a series, like a podcast series to, Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't, obviously I'm basketball junkie. So I like, I would love to to hear anybody's ideas about you know like a basketball related series that in in that sense or i mean it doesn't even have to be basketball like i've had the thought of you know i think a i don't know how well received it would be but maybe like you break down the the chad morris era right. like you could go over like the the late game collapses the turning points in the season because there were i feel like there were major turning points in each of his two seasons the quarterback ineptitude the time that he said Arkansas momentum was wearing an Arkansas jersey after a win over a Mountain West Conference team, like, and then the, the and then the firing and then the hiring. He's he gets hired on by one of the guys that he was, you know, he was close to all those years ago when he was a high school coach and still close to now, like stuff like that. Like we're we're interested in that. We're open to, to any ideas you guys might have. For sure. All right, well, that is Scotty Borderline. Make sure to stay tuned to wholehogsports.com for all of the information that he is going to be giving, the information that our entire team is going to be giving you. And also make sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you are listening to it right now. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. You can also leave us a comment. We read those as well. All right, for Scotty Borderline, I am Seth Campbell saying thank you for joining us, and we will see you back here next week.